Thanks for joining us for Subject to Change. We're here with Brian Alexander, futurist, talking about education. And is that a <laughs> stack of tabletop games behind you? Oh my gosh, yeah. That's our whole... Well, we also have a couple of footstools full of games, but we just got um, Wingspan. What's Wingspan? Oh, oh. It's, it's pretty fun. I'm We've only played it twice with two people, so I think it... Um, it's it's like re oh it's like it's like a resource game and investing in your birds and creating flocks and winning special point characterizations and it's pretty cool. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. When you see the little microphone in the lower right, click on that to learn more. We're so glad you're here. How are you, Brian? I'm okay. I've been meaning to play Wingspan for a while. I just uh, every time I go to get it, it's out of print. Oh, yeah, we, we went to get bird food, and our local bird food place had a display of wingspan, which is huh. just so awesome. So we snagged it. Uh, very, nice. very nice. I, I like it. I like it very much. It's, um, I, I, you know how you play a game a couple of times, and you don't quite know the strategy yet? You're going through the motions? Uh -huh. we're, still, we're still going through the motions, but I like the motions. <laughs> and it's a beautiful design, all the oh, all pieces and everything. You learn about different bird types, Lauren, so it's kind of cool because at the same oh. time we got a bird book and we've been corresponding the birds in our backyard to the bird book and the game and learning about oh, ground nesting really and cool. perch nesting, nesting and all kinds of cool stuff. Habitats. Yeah. Your background looks great, Lauren. Thank you. I wish I could say it was mine, <laughs> but I'm enjoying it, it, so that's nice. We've got books, biophilia, and board games. Okay. All right. We're good. We're in a great spot now. <laughs> <sighs> We've got books, biophilia, and games. That you've That's, already covered that much? Well, in our backgrounds. Oh. Oh, I love that. Books, biophilia, and games. Nice. It yes. needs a B word. What's another instead of games? Um, Boards. Board, board oh. games. Books. <laughs> Books, biophilia, and board games. Uh, I just, I was just impressed at you grabbing biophilia out of that. That's really good. <laughs> That's actually my, uh, my thing is, is uh, biophilic design and learning from nature, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's all part of the, part of the process there. <laughs> so I'm so excited to hear about your book, Brian. I, I was when I saw this pop up on my calendar, I was like. I don't know what his new book is. So I quickly went and Googled and read your description of your book and what inspired you. And I was, I'm, thank you so much for, I can't wait to get it. It's going to be great. So wait, um, can Brian, can you tell us about it? Yeah. Yeah. Give us the lowdown. Yeah. Uh, we, let's hear we, it from you first. Are we recording? Yes. We are recording. We're good. Yes. Yes. And Yes. Uh, so I, I can describe what the book is about or how it came to be or what I'm hearing about it. Uh, what would you like? Yes, All yes, yes. Um, okay. Uh, I'm a futurist <laughs> specializing in the future of higher education. So uh, my previous book called Academia Next came out in uh, 2019, 2020, and it was a look at the next generation of American higher ed primarily. So for my next book, I wanted to look more deeply into the future and I wanted to take a more global approach. And as I was researching this, this daunting task, I was realizing that climate change was looking more and more crucial in any kind of attempt to forecast this. And yet I was finding very, very little discussion about it in higher education, you know, in the higher education press and conferences and periodicals. It's really bordering on malpractice. And in the futures field, increasingly people think that if you do any forecasting for anything, you know, for the military, for businesses, if you don't take climate change into account, that's basically malpractice. You know, it's like ignoring the economy or something. Um, it's about bloody time, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so but I, education was ignoring it. Uh, more or less. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's, it's interesting. I mean, if you just look back, there are a couple of bursts of energy uh, around the Paris Accords, for example, um, mm -hmm. but then they, they just go away. Um, and there's a whole interesting question, why? I mean, why is higher education not engaging overall? Um, but the, uh, the the more I delved into this, the deeper and more complex the problem got. Universities on fire. 
Um, and so this is what grew into a book. Um, and so the book actually looks at the next 75 years of higher education worldwide and connects that with the climate crisis to try to figure out the many intersections. And there are a bunch of them, uh, which I can talk about if you like. I would yeah, love, I'd that. love that. <laughs> well, from the practical, it. I'm well, I'm really curious. So, as you know, I teach at a local um, community college and we're we're at this really interesting point in time where, you know, enrollment is down. Students have higher anxiety than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, it's starting to translate into people asking for certain types of classes and even like how do we teach some of this content, especially as the world's growing more polarized. And so I'm very interested in, in how to bring this into a classroom with such diverse backgrounds of people at a community college, because we get, every, I mean, all colleges get everyone, but like we get everyone. Right? Well, you really do. I, mean, you're, I mean, hence the name, the community right. college. Right. And community colleges for me, you know, do more with less than anybody in higher ed. Um, Agreed. Reach changes to the curriculum. One of the intersections has to do with teaching, uh, the teaching mission of higher education uh, and how that connects with climate change. So uh, one of the dimensions is we have to think about the curriculum. Do we teach more and more about climate change? And there are a lot of signs that there is both demand for this and potentially supply. Uh, demand comes especially from traditional age undergraduates, which are, I mean, it depends on the community college, what percentage that is. Um, and a part, it depends on how you define it, you know, age zero, um, up to 24 or whatever. But all the polls show generational differences on climate change are enormous. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you ask people under 30, climate change is a leading concern. You ask people over 60, it's really, really low on the list. Um, so part of it is just to answer demand. Uh, and part of it is to respond to the world as the world gets more and more interested in this, you know, you know, at a policy level, at a corporate level, more nonprofits being involved, um, plus the research enterprise, which I'll, I'll come back to. Uh, so mm -hmm. all this suggests an expansion of the curriculum. And, th and this can occur in mul multiple ways. This can just mean infusing climate change stuff into another class. So you right. teach philosophy 101, you know, asking some you know, good discussion questions based on climate issues. Uh, mm -hmm. You're teaching a historical survey, you know, European history for a thousand years, and you spend more time talking about the impact of climate changes. Uh, it can be more classes specifically on this. And, and these are across the curriculum. And I'll, I'll come back to this when we talk about research, but you know, everything from biology to history, uh, to sociology, to economics. To, then, to repair, to hands-on car tech i mean seriously it's and and that's actually i wanted to just put a put a light on that statement about um there are very many different ways to bring sustainability into the curriculum and, and an awareness of climate change and one of the things that's always disturbed me in in business and it's disturbing me now even in business and and in education is we tend to take something that's such a core principle um, and keep it in a separate curriculum. And then after a long time, we start to realize that maybe it has to be folded into the curriculum. So at some point, I'd like to get some reflections on that, but I want to hear the rest of what you're going to say. Situational changes. You mentioned uh, car repair and automotive yeah. work in general. So we think about diesel technology and well, as we transition the overall uh, transportation fleet away from burning fossil fuels uh, and to electricity, uh, you know, that changes what we teach, you know, repairing yeah, electric cars different, right? Um, but then think about how this plays out in culinary arts. Uh, oh, if, absolutely. I mean, the, the big push, and this is anathema to a lot of America, but the big push is towards more plant-based food away from mm -hmm. so much meat and animal products. So that changes what you serve. Uh, think about ag classes um, yeah. and you know, how you're going to train people to go off and work in uh, in, in agriculture. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think this plays out uh, across the curriculum. But then to, to get back to your point, Lauren, this, there's, there's also changes in pedagogy. So... Mm -hmm. For example, do we uh, push for more project-based and inquiry-based learning? So, yeah. you know, I mentioned agriculture, right? So, how does the how does the town's agriculture sector change under the impact of of uh, global warming? Uh, and so, you map that out, and that's going to lead you across the disciplines, from you know history to meteorology, environmental studies, and, and so on. And then there's gameplay. 
I also think, and this is for your background, your literal background, Jody, uh, I think game-based learning and simulation-based learning uh, really come to the fore here because that's a great way to think through the complex problem of climate change. Um, and of in course- In a safe space, right? In yeah. a safe way. Yeah, have you played the game CO2? Not yet, and you mentioned it last time we talked, and yeah. I haven't yet gotten it, but that's definitely, and I had I had mentioned that I also have a in the works a module to add to Catan about climate change. Oh wow! I would. I'm developing it. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I need like I need like players to refine it. And yeah. uh, okay, all right. <laughs> but I gotta I gotta actually invest enough time to get it to a point where I can send it to people and say try this and tell me what you think. Things like uh, not just you know climate disaster aspects that would affect the game, but things like getting extra points if you create a shared market for local foods and you end up getting more resources mm -hmm. because you've created a, a localized essential food market, things mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. anyway, don't mean to take it away from no, what we're talking about. No, it's, but like, I mean, really that, that starts to teach people from, I don't know how old you can start playing Catan, but that like um, starts getting five. people thinking and realizing about things like that so much earlier on. We're burdened by a lack of wonder. What I've come to learn from at least my students and Brian, I don't know what you found in your research, but there's like a lack of wonder that seems to be taking place. Like the, the students right now seem very like resolved that like this is their future. And I'm not getting the sense of like dreaming and sense of wonder and a sense of like, we could change this or the world could look differently. And actually, Jody, I, I realized this because I've been doing the 2041 project with my classes, like oh, every yay. semester. And it's then that they're like, oh, like I, one student said to me, I didn't know I was allowed to think like this. Oh, God, And that's that brilliant. was the most profound and sad yeah statement i have ever heard i didn't know i was able to think like this or allowed to think yeah. like this it's like who controls how you think and what exists behind the education well and that's actually i think i haven't read your book brian but in the description that you gave me i was really excited because you start to talk about the influences behind educational planning and institutions that might actually be part of our students this is my supposition on the very little i know that might be behind some of our students feeling like they don't have a voice because if big money is moving big decisions without no. the input of the communities then 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 how do you how do you deal with that we see that in our political system and now I'm getting a sense that that's what your book covers a lot of. So these are these are two key pieces. Uh, I mean, so uh, Jody, one aspect of this is thinking about climate justice and trying mm -hmm. you know, trying to make our mitigation efforts, uh, you know, equitable and also to redress historical inequities, which is you know really really vital. Uh, and this really matters. It depends on the country where you're in. Um, how this can play out. I mean, the marginalization and the unequal impact can play out by race, by gender, by religion, by geography. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to keep that in mind. And I tried to suffuse that throughout the book. Wow. Um, Let's not forget climate anxiety. To Lauren's point, the um, there's a there's a complex psychology here, which I think most faculty just don't have the training to, to think about and need help with. Um, so imagine, for example, the students who come to you with that kind of climate anxiety. And just as a side note, in psychology, people are researching the different types of this. Um, you know, there's a term like solastalgia, right, which describes the kind of pain memory of being able to remember a climate that you grew up with, but you can no longer access. Um, and which is very disorienting. Uh, the great philosopher of science, Bruno Latour, talked about the sense that the earth is kind of unmoored beneath our feet. Um, mm. So how do you how do you support that in class? I mean, do you avoid the subject? I mean, does it become a kind of trigger warning thing? You know, where note, we're going to be talking about anthropogenic climate change and students can opt out. Um, or do you uh, do you foreground it? And how do you do that without, you know, wrecking students brains? Um, and, and the one way of doing this is, I think, to uh, try to respond to students' needs. Um, another, though, is to work with mental health professionals about the ways to do this. But on top of this is the challenge that some of the students are going to come to you with actual trauma. 
if they mm -hmm. have been through a terrible fire uh, called accelerated or caused by climate change, if there are my climate migrants coming to you from a place where wet bulb temperature is unlivable, uh, if they come to you from a situation like you know Hurricane Sandy, um, are they you know how do you honor that experience? How do you make space for that in your class without re-traumatizing them and making it worse? Uh, I, I think wow. Um, one positive way of thinking about this, I've heard from Colorado College, where it just was a couple of weeks ago, they have a, a big climate commitment, really unusual. Most colleges are nowhere near this. Uh, and they have one program where students, so these are undergraduates, they live in a special ecologically designed housing area, and they do a lot of ecological work, including teaching K through 12 kids about climate. And they report back that the students who do this feel psychologically better you know that they have mm -hmm. done uh, and they've taken action and they feel just a reward you know that they've done this and that this is positive experience so i, I think that's kind of that's a long-winded answer to your question lauren to to circle around and to say you know if we can actually teach this and teach this well in a way that involves students making stuff and doing action uh then i think mm -hmm. that's good for their mental health so that actually tracks for me because we used to have a program up on campus called the service learning project that the students needed to complete in order to do their graduation. The program lapsed, but my students liked it so much that I've actually just made it an assignment as part of a class that I teach. And I started to define the projects that they could work on. Like I actually set them up and I almost wonder if instead I almost slant it towards a an environmentally I mean we do a lot in construction as part of these service mm -hmm. learning projects because they're architecture and design students and it's just good to know how things are built but I wonder if I could take it a step further and make it a specifically sustainable construction project that they work on that starts to do the same exact thing because they do they all come back and they're like wow that was a really great experience I know I just helped yeah. someone yeah. I learned something, they found it very beneficial. So I wonder if for me, I can kind of tool it in that direction. I think the answer is definitely yes. I think you should also open it up and think about deconstruction because deconstruction Ooh, yeah. is the next conversation we're having policy-wise on reducing carbon in the built environment. So if yeah. you can, more kids can deconstruct, they can see how things are put together. They can appreciate the True. age of materials, the reusability. Um, it puts a whole nother slant on it as well as energy efficiency, which tends to be the go-to, you know. Yeah, I remember this when ESF amazing. was doing some deconstruction, they they were trying to make mm -hmm. room for new dorms up on campus. And Kevin Stack was a part of that. And I think he yep. kind of like brought some students up, maybe against yeah. the wishes of people. I don't remember the exact <laughs> no doubt. of that. So that would be interesting to see how I could do that and keep my job. And there are opportunities in green jobs. That sounds terrific to be able to do. Um, and And I mean, You've got the combination of hands-on work with with uh, with theoretical work, and of course, this is oriented mm -hmm. towards jobs. And and this is another pointer. And I know, I know this. Even raising this subject can drive some people, you know, to to being very upset. But thinking about higher education as pointing students towards jobs, um, mm -hmm. first, there's the whole growing body of green jobs. Uh, and, and some of these are explicitly right. green jobs when you think about, uh, um, you know, managing uh, solar panel installations um, or, you know, working on a grid. In fact, one of the great crying needs is uh, electrical engineers. I mean, everything from people mm -hmm. who can basically make connections to people who can design power plants. Uh, it's a huge, huge need. But then there's also uh, just people who can help anybody with the climate transition. Uh, I've heard this from companies all over the place that they want someone to help them, you know, should they do more recycling? How should they change their fleet? What should they do about electricity in their building? Um, and just you know, providing graduates who can do that, I think it's just a, it, it's a great, great career path. Um, and again, you know, you can you can make money at that as a career and make your career, make your degree, you know, really valuable and useful. We want sustainability to become invisible. Actually, that's a question I always get as somebody who's been, you know, my, my title was director of sustainability for 15 years uh, for a, a government authority. And I would often get people contacting me for career advice on how can I get into a sustainability job? 
what? And I said, yeah, you, you get into any job and you make it a sustainability job. That's how you get into a sustainability job because we all have to be doing things differently. And, and maybe as far as higher education, creating that connective thought process. And what I was going to say before that I forgot and now I remembered is also uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion isn't a separate course that you take or a separate um, certificate program. It's it, it should be part of the core thought process for whatever you're doing, right? Um, the same thing with being aware of nature's systems and how we're impacting them with programs and projects. And, and I think that if we start to learn those things that need to be kind of the, the base core principles, we'll make better decisions across the board, no matter the industry, no matter the program, no matter the education track. Yes. I mean, in a sense, this might become invisible. This might become uh, yes. this might be a that, that just seeps into everything that we do. Um, but this is one of my cats, and she just had to show up to show off. Oh, what a beauty. Oh, thank you. Uh, What's her name? Ash. Uh, Ash. Whenever, For whenever a second, I saw, I saw her tail going, and I thought it was your beard had its own, its own yeah. uh, power source. Okay. <laughs> A bit similar. I start to look like my cats and they look like me. You know how this goes. Right? Yeah, um, that works. The whole, the whole teaching and learning aspect is is crucial uh, for understanding this. And maybe be informed by interdisciplinary R&D. But then it, it connects to to other domains in, in higher ed as well. Uh, I mean, I mentioned mm -hmm. research, research enterprise. And, and this is this is in many ways our leading point of contact because so much of the of the climate science so much of the climate research we have is generated by academics you know if you look at the mm -hmm. ipcc report and what it draws on if you'll get the scientists involved in the ipcc i mean so many of them are academics or academically adjacent you know people who are you know, researchers mm -hmm. or nasa for example the european space agency uh, and so i think it's likely that we will just continue to do this research and again this is interdisciplinary stuff I mean, if, if you look at so much of the research, it involves people from two, three, four, ten different disciplines. Uh, so there's an interesting challenge for colleges and universities, which is how to support this. Because uh, we're still very bound by our disciplines, and you know, it's still tricky to have this kind of inter or transdisciplinary work done. Um, but then there are other wow. sorry. So so that just brings up it is um I mean there's there's an ability to have the very traditional tracks, you know, we're gonna have you know somebody who's in computers science and somebody who's in an English program and somebody you know whatever whatever the the, the traditional track is so so are we weaving or infusing or do you explore or what do you think is it a do you have a cross-disciplinary kind of so that you're creating a weave or do you infuse the work within each of those traditional silos. Um, one of the things in government is I feel those silos actually break a lot of things. So I don't know if it's the if it's the same in academia if the if the benefit needs to come from the infusion or the weaving, but still separate. I don't know. I think it's really like an improv. Yes and uh, <laughs> I mean, yes I mean, and I mean, yes and you have very, very narrow fields that need to focus on this in a pretty particular way. I mean, I'm fascinated by how the humanities and the social sciences can intersect with this. Uh, so we think about religion and, and religious mm -hmm. scholars are actually quietly peeling off to take a look at this. Things like um, you, you look at Catholicism in the United States. You have some very, very conservative Catholics, including some in the Supreme Court. Uh, who are very mm -hmm. anti-climate change. And then you have the current Pope who published an encyclical, a major document, you know, calling on the faithful to act on climate change. Uh, so researching that, or if you look at, say, something like the Ganges River in India, uh, a holy object, which is draining, it's shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, what what does the impact have on, what is, what's the impact of that on believers? Uh, what happens to new religious movements that might appear um, that are you know, influenced and shaped by climate change? I mean, so, so, you know, researchers in religion can just focus on that, doing everything from you know, ethnography and qualitative study and quantitative work and all that. But then if you're going to take a look at, say, New York City, and you're trying to imagine mm -hmm. what the impact of sea level rise is going to do to New York City over the next 50 years, well, you need urban studies, you know, you need geology, 
Uh, you obviously need meteorology, earth science, environmental studies, but you also probably need uh, history. You unfortunately definitely need politics. And suddenly and you, know, you got this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, just field after field involved. So I, I, I think really both of these are, and, and what I expect to see is more campus centers. Um, and maybe those centers turn into academic programs or entire colleges. Maybe being the arts of the free person. The, the slogan that I've been putting out there is that the climate crisis is the new liberal arts. And mm -hmm. maybe some, maybe that will make sense for people. Uh, I mean, the, the original, you know, Latin phrase of this, you know, the, the arts of the free person, the skills, the abilities that someone needs, um, you know, it, that free person now needs to do this in a world increasingly racked by climate change. Um, yeah. yeah, I've been calling it full spectrum sustainability to mm. try and help people understand that it's not just about energy use. Mm -hmm. It's also about mm -hmm. diversity, equity and inclusion. It's also about the economy. It's also about health so yeah. totally about health it's yeah. also also about ecology and mm -hmm. loving you know uh birds and bees and squirrels even though they're pests those kind of things so um, well that's quite true or fuzzy little predators like the one i just right. my lap right um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's, yeah it's, uh, I, I think this is a mindset that will make absolute sense to an 18 year old who comes to campus uh, but mm -hmm. it's a more challenging mindset to the 60-year-old uh, who is trying to run an academic division. Um, and and we have to, you know, we really have to pivot and, and work on this. But wait, there's more. I mean, so so those are those are two dimensions to research and teaching. I and mean, that's a lot, right? But there's more, mm -hmm. as the commercials used to say, right? But wait, there's more. Um, <laughs> Lauren, you, you're, you're talking about the uh, the way that uh, community colleges have to respond to their communities, and they do so more than anybody else. Um, yeah, and but I think overall we have to really rethink what happens to town gallon relations. Uh, what does it mean to be a campus uh, in a physical community uh, when the climate mm -hmm. crisis is ratcheting up? Uh, to, to pick one example, uh, I, I spoke with a university that came up with a consensus on campus from everyone from the students to the trustees that they were going to build a solar installation right next to campus. It was on some community land that was wasteland. Uh, it was only used for grazing animals occasionally, perfect spot. And they, you know, they did all the planning, they're ready to go. And initially the local community supported it and thought this makes sense. This is good use of that land. And then uh, a vocal minority in the community uh, thought this was dangerous, that this was um, uh, a bad move to do, uh, and pretty openly aligned with oil and gas, uh, blocked it and managed to send me it completely. Um, so, I mean, this is one little, little story for one mm. camp, 4,000, right, or the 20,000 in, in the world. But you have to wonder about, for example, do you get, I mean, you know, in a blue state like New York, um, do you get the community, you know, your town or your, your county or your city, leaning on everybody inside? to do certain things. So electrify all of your vehicles, for example, stop serving meat, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. How do campuses get to respond to that? Um, if you're a public institution or a private institution, how does that play out? But it can also be the reverse. If the campus does more than the community, uh, do they cause friction? Like the case I mentioned earlier. Uh, how, I mean, there's so many possible synergies here where you can actually mm -hmm. do collaborative work that would be awesome. Uh, you know, you think about, I mentioned New York City, right? Imagine students at NYU or CUNY or Columbia uh, doing service work on an engineering project uh, to bolt yeah. up the line or to build a seawall. Uh, imagine faculty consulting on this, you know, uh, electrical engineers, right? Helping to design the power systems for this. Um, all kinds of positive connections there can be. This was part one of our conversation with Brian. Please check out part two. He's so well informed and his ideas can really change how we look at higher education. Be well and thanks for joining us at Subject to Change.